and I'd like to highlight some of um, his books, only a few of them, which have greatly influenced me, including Early Orientalism, Imagined Islam and the Notion of Sublime Power uh, with Routledge in 2014, in which he traced the role of Christianity in the making of various um, European racisms, or his book with Derek Penzler, Orientalism and the Jews. And then in the past 10 years, he's also shaped debates on illiberalism and race in the east of Europe, in um, concluding by a large five-year grant on illiberalism in the, in the east of the EU, and two special issues on Islamophobia in Europe's east and in Germany's east and west, in which he showed us that the east uh, is like the west, only more so. <laughs> Um, and just a few days ago, he published his keenly awaited new monograph uh, called Quite, but, um, White But Not Quite, Central Europe's Populist Revolt, which I believe we will hear a little bit more about today. Very more welcome. To Thank Ayn you. Kahn. Thank you very much, Alex, for that introduction. And uh, can everybody hear me in the room? I'm, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to thank uh, uh, the organizers, uh, Neil and uh, Alex, uh, for inviting me to this event celebrating 30 years of the remarkable Sussex European Institute that they uh, co-direct. Uh, Alex's work on race and racialization in and of Central and Eastern Europe has been groundbreaking. And I'm proud to be co-editing with her a special issue on the topic of the uh, Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. So my talk today is a way to try out some ideas for the introduction to this issue, which we hope to see in print by the end of this year. And I'll also develop some ideas from uh, the book that Alex mentioned, White But Not Quite, Central Europe's Illiberal Revolt. Perhaps we could see the a slide that uh, the, the publisher asked me to tell you that it's available at a discount now, and uh, I think it's the good discount, you know, it's like in three years or four years you'll see it in the used bookstore for 99 cents, but uh, right now you uh, have to pay a little more. Um, so, the next slide, please, I start today with a quote by Volodymyr Zelensky. And in a conversation with CNN reporter Matthew Chance, the Ukrainian president said, Ukraine is in the heart of Europe, and now I think Europe sees Ukraine as something special in this world. Um, so let's look at this phrase, the heart of Europe. People in many countries describe themselves as living there, in the heart of Europe, from Belgium and Germany to the Czech Republic and Poland, Geographically, of course, the center of Europe may be somewhere in Lithuania or Belarus. Europe is in practical usage a relative term. It depends on who you exclude. Belgium is at the heart of the continent if you include only the West. Germany is if you add the center. Poland and Ukraine if you add Russia. But the phrase heart of Europe is not just about something um, special, it's not just about the geographic, but also the cultural, even spiritual centrality of a region, about it being something special in this world, as Zelensky put it. Zelensky thinks, that is, he hopes, but is not quite sure, that Europe, that is the real Europe outside Russia, sees Ukraine's centrality now. That is, it did not see it before. It certainly did not. The occupation of Kiev's main square in 2013-2014 that toppled the then pro-Russian Ukrainian government was called Euromaidan or Euro Square because its most obvious demand was the acceptance of Ukraine into the European Union. Zelensky is still asking for it today and is still getting only vague promises in return. Even more faithfully, in its 2008 Bucharest summit, NATO postponed indefinitely admitting Ukraine. Obviously, Ukraine was not seen as central to the European construction by the EU or by NATO. There's a big difference between how Europe and the West have seen Ukraine and how Zelensky would like the world to see it and perhaps too optimistically thinks the world sees it now. My purpose today 
is not to focus on Ukraine as such, but I begin and will end with Ukraine because its current tragedy brings into the foreground a number of issues that I feel need to be urgently addressed in the study of Central and Eastern Europe in its global context. These issues concern the very notion of Central and Eastern Europe, or I should say rather the very notions in the plural of Central and Eastern Europe, because the notions of Central Europe and of Eastern Europe need to be examined both in their co-construction and separately. The borders of neither Central Europe or Eastern Europe are objectively given. For just that reason, it is interesting to ask what kind of work exactly is done when they're used as if they did refer to a distinct, objectively identifiable reality. The use of such terms is seldom innocent. So the challenge is to discover what exactly using the term Central and Eastern Europe as an unexamined, undifferentiated unit buys and for whom. And what, on the other hand, is achieved by using Central Europe as different from Eastern Europe and closer to the West? In both uh, cases, the case of Eastern Europe and the case of Central Europe, we're dealing with a sort of ambiguous in-between position. Eastern Europe is ambiguously located between the core West and the post-colonial South. And Central Europe is in turn ambiguously located between the core West and Russia. We can speak here perhaps of nesting in-betweennesses, and perhaps we can speak of co-constitution. North and South co-constitutes through their difference Eastern Europe, and Eastern and Western Europe co-constitute Central Europe. The ambiguous constitution of Central Europe between the West and the East of the continent has been crucial to the construction of the notion of Central Europe from its beginning in German conservative thought in the early 19th century, through its many iterations, both progressive and conservative, up until its current use by Viktor Orban to denote a specific form of white patriarchal European identity. To deconstruct the concept of Central Europe must trouble the facile equation implied by the phrase Central and Eastern Europe. It needs to bring the West at least as much as the East into the picture, and along with the West, its relationship to the global South. Troubling the equation is not to deny the common fate that Central and Eastern Europe have shared in various periods, including, for example, the period of the so-called second serfdom examined by Manuela Boatka, or of course the period of communist socialism studied by James Mark. Central Europe has experienced inter-imperiality quite strongly due to their proxi its proximity to the Russian and Ottoman empires. Nevertheless, in the long durée, and with the exception of the socialist period, in terms of the existential dialectical concept of buying empires proposed by Lara Doyle, most of Central Europe was for most of its history more a part of Western rather than Russian vectors of imperiality. This is true again today. Central Europe, like Eastern Europe, and indeed Europe, is a term whose geographic correlates are flexible and ambiguous. The countries most commonly and by general consensus referred to as Central Europe include Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. These countries are politically and economically integrated with, though not in simple ways and not as equal partners, the European Union and NATO. In my book, I show that on a number of measures ranging from freedom of press, democratic governance, gross domestic product, wages, criminality, and attitudes to minorities, these four countries differ among themselves, but also as a group are actually more like the West than they are like the areas of the former Soviet Union, including Russia and Ukraine, or even some Eastern EU members like Bulgaria. Why then, more than three decades after the raising of the Iron Curtain, does the undifferentiated notion of Central and Eastern Europe persist? The truth is that in spite of talk about unity across the continent, 
The West never really intended to fully welcome the East, including Central Europe. In an essay published in 1983, the Czech and later French writer Milan Kundera imagined famously or infamously, depending on your attitude to him. Uh, the slides? No, we don't. It's, okay. Ignore the slides for now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a picture of Kundera. Uh, so Kundera uh, said that uh, Central Europe was a part of the West, as you, many of you know, that was kidnapped to the East by the Soviet incarnation of Orthodox Russia. And whatever you may think of Kundera, he was expressing a longing to be reunited with the West that was widespread, if not universal, in, in Central Europe. I, I think Mary probably would agree with that. But in Central Europe, but if Central Europeans dreamed of moving their country into the West, Western business was intent on moving East and not only into Central Europe, but also Russia, sometimes with the co cooperation of communist era local managers, Western capital took over key positions in Central in the Central and Eastern European economies. Eventually, it faced competition from local business described by Agnes Gadi in the Hungarian case as, quote, national capitalists, unquote. The weakness of the national capitalists is relative lack of capital. Their strength is their ability to penetrate the political class, including through corruption. In Russia, complex relations between the government and national capital eventually led to a powerful symbiosis between the government and what in the West were first called simply gangsters and then oligarchs, labels meant to delegitimize Eastern business competition. This resistance by Russian capital was ultimately successful in maintaining the independence of Russian imperiality in the business sphere, even if, as always, cooperation does exist between vying empires. Though the former German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder has served in leadership positions with Rosneft, Gazprom, and Nord Stream, no one would suggest that German business dominates these Russian corporations. If anything, it's been the other way around. The national capitalists of Central Europe, but especially of Poland and Hungary, may have similar ambitions to those in Russia. But given their smaller economies, the imposition of EU strictures, and their dependence on capital infusions both by the EU and by private Western businesses, Central European national capitalists are more limited in their ability to take themselves out of the Western system. So Western capitals designs on controlling both Central and Eastern Europe only succeeded in Central Europe. They largely failed to subdue Russia. Even though Western capital did not succeed in dominating Russia, however, the logic of division between areas of accumulation and areas of cheap labor and captive consumption dictates that Central Europe be still regarded as an other, still not quite Western, not quite European, not quite civilized, still too much like Russia. Equating Central and Eastern Europe discursively can serve this goal. It is a form of racism, and racism against Eastern Europeans due to this logic, does not recognize a distinctive central Europe. It, it may be, the logic is that of racial capitalism. It may be unusual, perhaps provocative, to speak of racism by white people against white people. But we know well today that racism is not always a matter of color. Racial distinctions can latch on to practically any differences. Race is a social construct defined not by objective data as much as the mechanism that creates it. For many centuries, the mechanism that creates race has been capitalism. Recently, a number of scholars such as Satnam Verdi have referred to this aspect of capitalism as racial capitalism. The notion has long roots going back to, by the way of Stuart Hall, all the way to, as I see it, Rosa Luxemburg if not beyond that. In the historical context of capitalism, 
Liberal democracy has not delivered on its promise of liberty, equality, and fraternity. The chief proponents of liberal democracy in the core West never really meant to extend that promise to others. Racism appeared at the dawn of the colonial adventure to differentiate between those deserving full rights, white people, and those not racialized as people of color. The white population of the core colonial countries became the beneficiary of wealth accumulation. In this sense, the privileges of wealth and of power associated with wealth were, as they still mostly are, a form, a major form of white privilege. By its nature, capitalism continues to create divisions between core areas where capital accumulation takes place and peripheral areas serving as sources of cheap labor and natural resources. Such divisions are racialized and the division between East and Western Europe is one of them. White privilege has never been granted to all white groups equally. Like the accumulation of capital, the related accumulation of white privilege functions along intersectional lines. Racial as well as class privilege, as feminist scholars have noted, favors men more than women who have been charged with the labor of reproducing it. And today, in every core white majority country, such as the United States, England, or France, there are groups of white people who have not enjoyed the prosperity achieved by some during the triumphant period of neoliberal globalization in the 90s. The less educated and those living in rural areas, for example, though white, continue to be excluded from the glamour of the major world cities. In Eastern Europe too, a few stylish neighborhoods in Warsaw or Budapest have come to enjoy the good life. But as the socialist factory and agricultural system collapsed, large numbers of people got jobs in the assembly shops established by Western and Asian companies or toiled in precarious positions with decreased social benefits. Labor was cheap, regulation lax, and corporate taxes low. Eastern Europe's nearshore location cut transportation costs. Membership in the EU eliminated import duties. In the Baltic countries, Slovakia and Slovenia, the adoption of the euro even canceled the currency risk. In other places, central banks like to peg the local currency to the euro anyway. So on the whole, having survived the brutal so-called transition from communism, Eastern Europe has remained a white periphery, comparable mutatis mutandis to the depopulating countryside and the rust belts of the West, where too some people support illiberal leaders such as Marine Le Pen or Donald Trump. It is in the nature of racial capitalism and its inequalities to generate and be generated by racism. And it should not be surprising that this is so also when the inequality is between Western Europe on one hand and Central Europe on the other. And a number of, uh, of scholars uh, in Britain especially uh, have identified, and particularly during the Brexit debate, verbal and even physical attacks on Eastern Europeans as a form of racism. I add two brief examples, and one of them is in the next slide. So here is a picture from a scene in Scotland a few years ago uh, of a sign banning Eastern European fishermen from a Scottish pond. Note that the ban is addressed to all people indiscriminately of what is described with the Cold War expression, Eastern Bloc. Uh, can we, uh, next slide. The other picture is of a much worse incident. It shows Josef Kovanets a Slovak businessman who had been taken off a plane in Belgium, apparently for obstructing the work of the crew. Here, in a shot from a video camera, he's being restrained by police who were allegedly choking him while another officer makes the Nazi salute. So this happened in 2018. Maybe we can go back to the first slide. Uh, though Hovenetz's wife, compared the violence against him to the infamous police murder by choking of George Floyd in America in 2020, it would certainly be wrong to suggest that the exploitation of white workers anywhere in Europe 
is as dehumanizing a racism as racism against people of color. Even the less fortunate white people generally enjoy some of the fruits of local and global white privilege. Contrary to insistent protests by, Eastern, by Central European right-wing nationalists, the area has always benefited and continues to benefit from the colonial and post-colonial white privileges of Europe. Anyone who's been both to Eastern Europe and the Global South need not be told of the difference in living conditions. And it would be obscene to equate the prevalence of brutal racism towards African Americans to Western racism against Eastern Europeans. A closer comparison could be made really to Eastern European racism towards the Roma. At the same time, just about every Eastern European knows how it feels to be, if not attacked, then dismissed or demeaned by Western white people. A recent tweet that came my way said, quote, all I have to say about the Eastern Europeans as white people readily embraced by the West debate is that people saying this have clearly never been immigrants from Eastern Europe to the West. An excellent summary of racism against Eastern Europeans is a video by Alex Levitsky, uh, which you may find on YouTube. Uh, on the Sussex European Institute channel, and which sums up much of what will appear in her forthcoming Journal of uh, Ethnic and Migration Studies article. Alex shows how neoliberal policies have, uh, quote, have attributed a distinctive positionality to Eastern Europeans in Western European racial hierarchies, unquote. But Alex also points out, as she will in our forthcoming special issue, that racism against European migrants does not arise only after they move to the West. It is generated in the context of the same system of inequality formed under the sign of global neoliberalism that marks also the resident populations of Eastern, including Central Europe. The response by Central and Eastern Europeans is not always what we like it to be. In my book, I argue that the illiberal movement in Central Europe, as elsewhere in the white periphery, is a misguided struggle aiming not to dismantle the oppressive system of white privilege, but rather to secure a better position in it, to be recognized as fully white. This form of false consciousness is an obstacle to solidarity between peripheral whites clinging onto a precious form of white privilege and people of color who are excluded from white privilege in principle. It can work against class solidarity as when white workers in precarious positions oppose migrant or native born workers of color. It also pits people on the Eastern side of the divide in Europe against each other in a struggle to prove who is less Eastern European and more Western, more white. As other racisms, racism against Eastern Europeans is transitive. It is absorbed and displaced by the people who are targeted to those who they feel fit the racialized stereotype better than themselves. In Poland itself, Ukrainian migrants have been targeted similarly to Polish migrants in the UK. Although Polish society has mobilized admirably to help Ukrainian war refugees, a survey published by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe estimated that in 2016 to 17, more than 44,000 hate crimes against Ukrainians were committed in just one Polish province. Clearly, Ukrainians, next door neighbors of Russia, are at the bottom of the scale built by anti-Eastern European racism. As always, racism in this case reflects material conditions. West to East, there is an axis in Europe of nesting economic relationships marked by ethno-racial difference. Many Central Europeans go to Britain to work at low paying, low status jobs, but in Central Europe, the same is true of Ukrainians. It was certainly true of the psychologist from the Donbass region who was appointed to run a Ukrainian language helpline for traumatized refugees in Slovakia. To do this work, she had to be pulled from her cleaning job. In fact, it's been reported that almost 10% of the Ukrainian refugees in Slovakia, most of whom are female, have found jobs as uh, house cleaners. 
In Toronto, I interviewed a cleaner who came from Ukraine some time ago. She speaks Ukrainian, Russian, and Polish. Why Polish, I asked. She told me it was because before she came to Canada, she worked as a cleaner in Poland. And now that she's in Canada, her knowledge of Polish comes in handy because she works, as she put it, mostly for Polish ladies. And so the notion of, notion of Central Europe serves to undermine the binary East-West distinction, but at the same time also perpetuates it by transitively applying its assumptions to allegedly more Eastern European neighbors. There's an imagined and racialized hierarchy of civilization of Westernness, and I will argue of whiteness, gradually decreasing in roughly the eastward direction. The southern extension of this hierarchy targets the Balkan region of Eastern Europe. In his typically flippant manner, Slavoj Žižek has asked, quote, where do the Balkans begin? The Balkans are always somewhere else, a little bit more towards the southeast. For the Serbs, they begin down there in Kosovo or in Bosnia, and they defend the Christian civilization against this Europe's other. For the Croats, they begin in Orthodox, despotic, and Byzantine Serbia, against which Croatia safeguards Western democratic values. For Slovenes, they begin in Croatia. And we, he says we because he's Slovenian, and we are the last bulwark of the peaceful middle Europa. For many Italians and Austrians, they begin in Slovenia, the Western outpost of the Slavic hordes. For many Germans, Austria itself, because of its historical links, is already tainted with Balkan corruption and inefficiency. For many North Germans, Bavaria, with its Catholic provincial <laughs> flair, is not free of Balkan contamination. Many arrogant Frenchmen associate Germany itself with an Eastern Balkan brutality entirely foreign to French finesse. And this brings us to the last link in this chain, to some conservative British opponents of the European Union for whom implicitly at least the whole of continental Europe functions today as a new version of the Balkan Turkish Empire with Brussels as the new Istanbul, a voracious despotic center which threatens British freedom and sovereignty." Unquote. In the more uh, strictly easterly direction, the same might be said with Russia rather than Turkey being the limited empire of Eastern despotism. In the 17th and 18th century, the Ottoman court functioned in European thought to encode the absolutist as opposed to the constitutional option of government. But from the early 19th century, ideas of Oriental despotism referenced Russia as importantly as Turkey. In the case of the Balkans, Milica Bakic Hayden spoke of the phenomenon observed by Zizek as nesting Orientalisms, which, with each country along the northwest to southwest axis orientalizing the next. It meant that each successive country was seen as more similar to Turkey. Now, along the more easterly orientalizing axis, we also see the kind of displacement of one's own easternness. Eastern Germans see themselves as more Western than Czechs, who in turn see themselves more Western than Slovaks, who see Ukrainians the same way. What this means is that each sees their Eastern neighbor as more like the Russians. What we are dealing with here is a system of displacement of the illiberal authoritarian impulse in Western society to the backward East, thereby allowing the white West to shine as the region of pure democracy. In gender terms, the displacement projects the problem of patriarchal and heteronormative oppression to the East and in the direction of Russia. In racial terms, it projects racism including Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in the same direction as well, as if these were limited to the East. Sadly, this displacement mechanism has been adopted by some Central Europeans, including those with liberal inclinations, who feel that they're able to move the stigma of Eastern European backwardness to their Eastern neighbors. Michal Buchowski, identified the formation of the Visegrad Alliance in 1991 as having this sort of thing as its original raison d'etre to show the West that Central Europe is readier than the real East to adopt without protest to the global neoliberal demands of Western capital. 
Needless to say, Ukraine has found itself from this perspective as part of the real East together with Russia. Euromaidan was an expression of a long-standing desire by Ukrainians to change this and for Ukraine to move from the eastern margins to the heart of Europe. But it's always been an uphill battle. It's the radical distancing of Eastern Europe in the direction of Russia and of Ukraine, more so than of the classic core of Central Europe, that is partly responsible for the fact that Ukraine was not accepted into the EU and into NATO when Russia was still weaker, and so it was still more easily possible. It's not only Putin, but previous to the invasion, many Western and Central Europeans too, who saw Ukraine as just too close to Russia. In the West, they may have also worried quietly that Ukraine, if admitted, would turn out to be another illiberal Hungary or Poland. It remains to be seen if Ukraine's heroic struggle will help other Europeans to recognize Zelensky's vision of his country as something special located in the heart of Europe. But at the very least, the Ukrainian tragedy shows why anti-European racism and the distinctions, both gross and subtle that it creates, must be eradicated or at the very least acknowledged. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Ivan. And as much as I know we're all now burning to hammer Ivan with questions, <laughs> Um, I would like you to hold on, hold your thoughts. You'll get an opportunity in a second. Oops, what am I doing? Um, and uh, we're moving on straight to Professor Manuela Buasca. A very warm welcome uh, to Sussex. She is Professor of Sociology and the head of the Global Studies Program at the University of Freiburg. Um, the Global Studies Programme comes with a warm recommendation to everybody tuning in online. <laughs> Very great experience. Um, she has published widely, uh, widely as well, but also widely on world systems analysis, uh, decolonial perspectives on global inequalities, uh, gender and citizenship and coloniality, and the geopolitics of knowledge in Eastern Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Uh, she influenced me in particular in appreciating the parallel and co-constitutive political economic forces that have contributed to crafting ideas of Europe at its peripheries and semi-peripheries. Um, and in particular, her, um, her notion of the global coloniality of power. Uh, she's uh, led on multiple large-scale grants, um, and among her most influential books are Global Inequalities Beyond Occidentalism with Routledge, Decolonizing European Sociology with Ashgate, and forthcoming this October, we're all very excited, um, is Creolizing the Modern Transylvania Across Empires together with Anka Pavolesco, which I believe she will talk about today to us. And I understand she will trouble our understanding of Europe as uh, a geographically, culturally, religiously, and racially coherent entity. Very excited to hear more about this. Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you, Neil um, and Alex, for organizing this. Um, this whole event is a, an honor to be a part of, and this panel feels um, intellectually and politically very cozy for me. So <laughs> it's uh, it's nice to not um, be the kind of opponent, uh, either politically or intellectually or whatever, um, for a change, but actually have the love and care that goes into organizing a panel where the dialogue starts before you get to speak. So thank you for my, so much for this. Um, as Alex said, um, I am going to um, give it a little bit of a preview of um, some of the thesis in um, the book that sh um, she just mentioned, Creolizing the Modern Transylvania Across Empires, which obviously we're all doing a little bit of advertising here, which could come across as shameless, but at the same time, to me is a, a sign of how vibrant the um, work in the field of um, not only East European studies, but also uh, moving away from the notion of studying Eastern Europe as the other into ki kind of complicating the notion of Europe in the very study of what it is that the East does and how it is imbricated, especially with the global South. And in that, um, the kind of um, notion that we are um, putting forth in the book with um, the idea of, uh, can I show the, thank you, <laughs> the cover 
um, the creolizing the modern um, so it's coming out in, in English, German and, and Romanian, hopefully this year. Um, in looking at um, one of Europe's most um, under theorized regions, Transylvania, um, is to move away from an understanding of how nation states fit or do not fit into our um, coherent notion of Europe, uh, but to actually go towards not, not just the global that um, James has uh, really pointed to um, as overcoming the national, but looking at be below the national, what is there as a unit of analysis that makes sense for us to look, uh, to look at in order to understand um, how Europe was made and how Europe was shaped. And as in the book, um, I like to counteract the notion of, of Europe as a coherent entity, whether that coherence is racial, religious, cultural, or of course, geographical to start with some of the things that um, Ivan has covered uh, by now very thoroughly. Um, and we do that um, in the book, and I'm gonna uh, go over my part in it because my co-author Anka Porvulescu is a literary scholar and uh, our division of labor um, had kind of the sociological and the literary scholar um, component to it. Um, but in doing my part, um, I'm gonna uh, look at how Transylvania and its location in Europe, but at the same time at the periphery of European empires um, is makes it an ideal candidate for the project that is a larger project, obviously, um, of creolizing Europe. This is not something that we um, have point, but it's a larger project that uh, we share with colleagues. So next slide, please. Um, coherence um, in the sense that Europe is a geographical entity, that Europe is a coherent project, or that Europe um, is one um, cultural or religious entity have um, been around for a very long time. Actually, before Brexit, the European Union was the project that um, at least um, had monopolized the notion of Europe, such that we tended to uh, treat um, Europe and the European Union as synonymous and not see any European countries that were not at least candidates to uh, membership in the European Union as European. So you'd say, are you in Europe or not? And that kind of gets inscribed into um, how one is treated in the West as an Eastern European citizen or migrant, or uh, are you European and um, how European are you? Yes, I was raised to think I was European, but now that you mention it, <laughs> apparently not. And this was shifting uh, as, uh, at least in my lifetime through my studies, how European I, I got to be. So um, that is this is kind of um, shifting, like I said, with Brexit, with the whole idea of the coherence of the European Union as a project itself. But then in that context, what can it mean to creolize the notion of Europe? For me, um, this is something that um, has to do with taking this critique of European coherence, not one step further, but maybe a couple of steps further, in that we learn from the shared faith, uh, sorry, from the shared fate with some of the colonized and peripheral regions in the Global South. And one of the ways of learning from the Global South is a learning from their theorizing of um, their own lived experience. And creolization is one such term that has been coined in the context of the Caribbean, but that I think can illuminate a lot of what we do and, and think about Europe. So creolizing the notion of Europe here means for me, taking into account the relations of power with the areas colonized um, and occupied by European states, whether or not this occupation was um, explicitly colonial. Thinking Europe from its colonial and imperial borders, which means not only in the past, but Europe still has colonized territories today, including in um, the Caribbean, but also in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Um, and that is something that is completely left out of the discussion, although this is an official fact that um, not even European Union bureaucrats would dispute. And in terms of a decolonial project, um, creolizing Europe would mean thinking modernity from coloniality, where the decolonial project would stop but I would like to add with Laura Doyle's concept that um, Ivan also mentioned, thinking modernity from coloniality and inter-imperiality. That means that inter-imperiality is one of the most um, neglected dimensions of what it means to um, have shaped Europe. 
And that neglect has to do with the fact that the East of Europe is normally defined out of um, Europeanness and has been so for quite some time. Now, why do we need to bring in a different concept from a different region with a different history? Um, obviously, the term creolization has been coined to describe processes of um, racial, cultural, and linguistic mixing, first of all, linguistic mixing in the Caribbean. But increasingly, it has been um, defined as a mode of transformation premised on unequal power relations that characterize modernity coloniality, starting with dispossession, colonialization, and enslavement. And one of the most helpful definitions I find comes from Stuart Hall. Could you um, show the slide, please? And then click again. Um, when he said, processes of cultural and linguistic mixing resulted from the entanglement of different cultures in the same indigenous space or location, primarily in the context of slavery, colonization, and the plantation societies characteristic of the Caribbean and parts of Spanish America and Southeast Asia. But according to Stuart Hall, this does not mean that this mixing occurred on the basis of equality. Could you click again, please? Um, so creolization always entails inequality, hierarchization, issues of domination and subalternity, mastery and servitude, control and resistance. Questions of power, as well as issues of entanglement, are always at stake. It is important then to keep these contradictory tendencies together rather than singling them their celebratory aspects, end of quote. So creolization is not a fancier word for multiculturalism or diversity. It is premised on power and that the pattern was the pattern of colonial power. So we use the term um, creolization in the book and in our endeavor um, as a method um, of rethinking, reframing, and creatively recomposing categories that have tended to structure sociological analysis, Europe being a central one of those, um, but from them coming to categories that have never been part of what it means to be Europe, such as uh, Transylvania as a region, but also um, more abstract theoretical categories such as the modern and um, more abstract methods such as the comparative method itself. What does it mean to creolize all of these dimensions? And for us, obviously, um, this is co uh, connected with the project of the creolization of theory by retrieving subaltern histories and experiences in both colonial and imperial situations and reinscribe them into social theory. And here too, I'd like to point to a learning process um, coming from Martinican writer Edouard Glisson, to show next one, when he said, the West is not in the West. It is a project, not a place. Um, and he meant to point to the very clear historical construct that, um, construct that is the West, but I'd like to claim that this is also very much the case for Europe itself. So Europe um, is not only a project rather than a place, as we've well seen, we don't know exactly where it ends and where its subdivisions start. Its current results also represent a problem, including the categorization of war in the midst of Europe. Oh, wait, where's the midst? Where's the heart? Where's the, um, where are the other organs then, if that's the heart? Um, now, elsewhere, I've argued that um, Europe has been used as a sanitized and ahistorical sociological category. Um, and I'm not going to be able to dwell on that, but I want to suggest here that um, what we need to do is to productively complicate the notion of Europe if um, we need kind of a shorthand definition of what creolization is, productively complicated, by rethinking from one of its most under-theorized um, peripheries, Transylvania, and that, me so Europe as a project, a process and a problem. Um, next click. <laughs> um, and then next slide. Uh, again, um, creolizing theory, Let's click again. That was not, I was meant to do the clicking, so I, it would not be a click, click, click <laughs> kind of <laughs> situation. <laughs> um, the uh, term creolizing Europe has first been used in, um, to my knowledge. Um, in the publication by Encarnacion Gutierrez Rodriguez and Shirley Tate um, on migration and identities in Europe, um, also with a kind of reference to Glissant, um, who, however, never used the word creolization himself. It's his 
translator into English who did that um, because Glissant was actually talking about métissage. Um, but then creolization became the, the word that was transported into um, the English language. And then from that, next one, please, um, the um, book by Françoise Lyonnais and Xu Meixu um, called The Creolization of Theory. So the project of creolizing Europe is contingent on the uh, project of creolizing theory so as to um, reinscribe the transnational experiences of people um, of peoples in regions racialized as non-European, but not only non-European, but also non-Western and also non-white um, regions, peoples, experiences, um, as well as the multiple entanglements between Europe and its colonies onto sociological thought. With our project, we also connect um, the reinscription of rural and peripheral histories into understanding the modern and the becoming of modernity, because we tend to, and sociology has tended to define modernity as urbanization, industrialization, and uh, basically move away from the rural. And for us, this is a, that much of an omission as the omission of the East of Europe in the history of Europe itself. Not that Eastern Europe is just rurality, but missing out on the rural uh, means missing out on a huge uh, part of modernity. And then finally, um, reframing um, the so-called traditional European empires as integral to modernity, coloniality, and interimperiality, instead of considering the um, Habsburg Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire as pre-modern empires, they go until the Sec uh, the, the 20th century, but all of a sudden we're still calling them pre-modern because when did modernity start if the 20th century is not modern. So um, here, um, getting into our um, uh, map first, exactly, <laughs> thank you. And then the next click, this is a, a map, um, one more please, <laughs> uh, drawn by um, our research assistant uh, Bogdan Batavu for um, the project that um, became then our book. We have uh, started our project as a multi-layered reading of one Transylvanian document, the novel uh, by the title Ion, which is the name of the main character, by Libero Ebranu, a novel first published in 1920. Please, please click. Uh, and translated into um, 13 languages, some of them almost immediately. And it's um, kind of plot um, dramatizes Transylvanian peasants' struggle for post-colonial land redistribution and language rights, among many other things, violence against women, uh, citizenship, the enslavement of the Roma, and um, some other dimensions as well. So, um, what we were looking at in uh, looking at locate the location of Transylvania, which you don't see here unless you understand how it was um, straddled by these empires, you see it actually in the um, um, Austro-Hungarian part of the southeastern Austro-Hungarian part that then um, borders Romania and the one you see one village there, it says Pripas. This is the village um, that Rebrano fictionalizes, but is actually a village in um, Transylvania where the action of the novel takes place and that entire um, kind of struggle for land reform and um, the different negotiation of rights between the Hungarian noblemen and the Romanian peasants who didn't have access to the rights uh, to the land, but also did not understand the language in which the trial to which they could access um, was being uh, Kind of held um, is part of all the inter-imperial context in which this um, is taking place. Why it is important for us? Um, Transylvania um, has existed as a, let's say, geopolitical entity since um, at least the 15th century, but it never became a state. Um, instead, it has been claimed serially by a number of empires and nation state and has maintained a separate identity within the Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg Empire, but ceased to exist in 1867 when it was incorporated into the Hungarian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it ceased to exist again on its own in 1918 when it was incorporated into Romania. And um, interestingly, that is maybe also the nexus to our discussion on, on Ukraine because um, 
Since 1918, Transylvania has remained a so-called historical province within the Romanian nation state. But like Galicia, um, with, so Western Ukraine, um, that became part of the Habsburg um, Empire, this um, region, Transylvania, belongs um, in Larry Wolf's words, to the category of extinct geopolitical entities. So a study of the region from whatever perspective uh, that takes this region as the starting point of the questions we raised, rather than uh, the end result of something that was meant to always become integrated into some nation state formation, is for us um, a singular perspective on the imbrication of nation building, post-coloniality, and inter-imperiality. Now, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the notion of coloniality of power, so just briefly, um, Anila Quijano, a Peruvian sociologist, call, um, coined the notion of coloniality of power in order to um, um, denominate the political, economic, and sociocultural hierarchies between colonizers and colonized that emerged with the conquest of the Americas in 1492. Uh, but the term coloniality is not just a play on words or a fancier term for colonialism, because the main um, claim behind the term is that coloniality uh, and the hierarchies that it put in place since um, the 15th century have um, outlived colonialism and are still with us today, racism being uh, one of its most pervasive forms, but also the economic dependency and um, the linkage with the racial hierarchy that goes hand in hand with it. Um, so in this sense, um, the um, idea that coloniality and um, historical implications of um, forms of colonial occupations are important has been there for at least the Atlantic realm um, very clearly made. In the context of the East of Europe, the um, importance or the relevance of colonialism has been at least very hotly debated. Can you please show? Um, basically one of the main proponents um, of uh, engaging with um, the category of post-coloniality, but at the same time also rejecting it has been historian Maria Todorova, whose concept of Balkanism was intended as an explicit departure from rather than a variant of um, Orientalism, um, as Edward Said had coined it. And uh, Maria Todorova objected to applying the category of post-colonialism to the Balkans, since in her words, um, post-colonial studies are a critique of post-coloniality, the condition in areas of the world that were colonies. So she's asking, what, what are the benefits of comparison um, between post-colonial areas and, and the world of um, the, Bal the Balkans? And the question, I think, is starting to receive more interesting answers than it has so far, because it has received some. Um, the next one is uh, the way it was addressed by um, Milos Jovanovic and Giulia Caravelli in um, a special issue of cultural studies that they co-edited called Off Center of Empire. Um, when they say focusing on sites marginal to the conventional post-colonial gaze, decenters two imagined geographies, that of post-colonial studies and the scholarship on so-called continental empires. The idea being to bring the two together. Now, what is off center of empire? Is that a better word for periphery or is it just a euphemism for it? I think uh, what that helps us do, kind of uh, rephrasing um, the, the methodological move that way, um, brings us back to the concept of um, the creolization of theory and creolization of Europe. And here, the um, um, Francoise Dioni and Xu Meishu have referred to this shift as the becoming theory of the minor. Now, um, they say this means thinking through and with invisibilized peripheral or subaltern formations, such as Transylvania, such as Galicia. Um, but we could see it as an equivalent of, or as at least compatible with, what Quijano and Mignolo call thinking from coloniality and what Laura Doyle has called thinking from inter-imperiality. Um, Lyonnais and Xu describe it as follows. Um, if minor formations become method and theory, then new analytics will be brought to the foreground to creolize the universalisms we live with today, doing so from the bottom up and uh, from the inside out. It is this process of becoming theory of the minor that we are also calling creolization. Now, 
have we achieved anything uh, with that other than claiming that this works? How does it work is the way uh, Laura Doyle uh, explains her concept of interimperiality. Uh, she now has a whole book on it, but uh, in 2013 was when she first coined the term um, by discussing how an interimperial method incorporates the insights of both transnational and world systems analysis and aiming to supplement their insights. Um, and she proposes that our understanding of the conditions of diasporic displacement, economic exploitation, or international resistance change, uh, changes if we not only look at Western European cores and peripheries, but also as they interact with Ottoman core and periphery, or Chinese core and periphery, or Russian core and periphery, or all at once. Because each state's core periphery policies and instabilities shapes that of others. So for us, the fact that we're looking at a region that never became a state in its own right is even more telling because most of the time, the, the correction that has tended to be uh, made and um, Laura Doyle and Xu Meishu um, have pleaded for engaging with Asian empire, with the Mughal empire, with the Ottoman empire, with Japan and China is that Eastern Europe falls through these cracks as well. When the move is, let's move away from the understanding of um, Atlantic enslavement and coloniality and look at uh, the Mughal and the Japanese empire, there's again one omission and that tends to be the east of Europe. And if we turn to um, these specific modes of inter-imperial positionality, uh, we can assess the core periphery dynamics shaping uh, Transylvania, both before and after the imbrication of inter-imperiality and coloniality. What we do is engage the constant tension uh, between the uh, Habsburg, Ottoman, Austro-Hungarian, and Russian empires as inter-imperial rivalry, but that doesn't mean that instead of states, we look at empires, and so we move um, one floor up, so to say, but that um, basically all the possibilities, and we see that in the novel that we analyze that starts and takes place in 1920, so all of this um, imperial formation is before that, um, is being negotiated trans-imperially. So of course, people, peasants, enslaved people are citizens of one or the other state and they are subjects of empire but they negotiate and they strategize trans imperially trying to find loopholes or possibilities across empires and this is what shapes legislation this is what shapes understanding of belonging this is what shapes multilingualism um, lingualism um, that we um, now i'm running out of time so i can't get into the historical uh, details but um, the next one maybe to say um, Romania founded in um, 1859 through the union of Moldova and Wallachia um, was basically founded three years after the enslavement of the Roma in Moldavia and Wallachia ended. So we don't have, for instance, the enslavement of the Roma in Transylvania, but there are echoes of the fact that they were enslaved in Moldova and Wallachia through the fact that people are crossing um, into Transylvania from these regions and that there's knowledge and there's understanding of how a specific racialized population had less rights so it can have less rights even though this is not legally codified. Um, at the same time we have inter-imperial movement with people from um, the entire parts of the east of Europe migrating such as many Europeans to the American colonies because it was desirable, it was possible and it was uh, promising for them. So there's this slogan in the 1920s, Mia uh, Shikolatoria in Romania, 1000 um, for a trip. So you make a trip to the Americas and you have the chance to come back with $1,000, um, which a lot of people took um, as, as an opportunity to an extent to which um, Hungary was restricting uh, emigration to Brazil, for instance, in 1925, I think it was, uh, because too many people were leaving. Now, when we hear Hungary was restricting emigration to Brazil, at that time, it meant um, that Transylvania was part of Hungary. So we see how the imbrication of inter-imperiality and coloniality plays a role here. And last, maybe, <laughs> slide, um, to see a telling sign of the inter-imperiality um, is the distribution of languages. You see here the ethnic groups in late 19th um, century Transylvania um, in a census that defined ethnicity through the mother tongue. 
uh, but you see the kind of absolute um, kind of mosaic of uh, languages being spoken. And of course, it's not clear here how many languages one person spoke. And we know that not only um, intellectuals, but peasants and, of course, religious leaders spoke at least several languages, which is more than two. Um, so we discussed that in the book as um, interglottism rather than polyglottism, because the inter refers us to the hierarchy of languages. If you spoke Romanian and your land claim was tried in court in Hungarian, you had no chance and you had to sign um, that you understood and that you accept the verdict, although you did not. Now the final slide, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but I'm finishing. Uh, just to uh, bring the strands together um, with Laura Doyle's um, statement, you know, we should not stay with the Eurocentric assumption that um, Western European imperialism accounts for all recent imperialism. Uh, understanding that a region of the world is either a European colony or a post-colony or it was never colonized. Things are messier which is not itself a sociological concept, but I think if we take the messy to understand that it is a method of creolization, of recomposing from all these histories, a, a way of telling the history of Europe that does not go through the lens of a nation state and how successful that was, we see that inter-imperiality both precedes coloniality, it, it's before 1492, the enslavement of the Roma starting in the 14th century, for instance, and it is, it becomes itself a form of capitalist enslavement. But if inter-imperiality precedes coloniality, it also coexists with it and it outlasts imperialism. So we need both. This is not a plea for leaving behind a um, coloniality project, but of joining it with inter-imperiality in order to um, make other European spaces legible as inter-imperial spaces that are not such today. If we just look at them when Maria Todorova says they are not post-colonial, we don't need to engage with the concept. So maybe that is a possibility to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>